because that had been so much of my life. I went into the Air Force. I was in the Strategic Air Command for four years uh, as an aircraft and missile hydraulic technician, which is, uh, I worked on the, uh, the uh, pneumatic and hydraulic systems of B-52 bombers, KC-135 aircraft, and Minuteman missiles. I had a secret security clearance. Uh, that's where I saw my first atomic bomb. I mean, we worked around on these planes, uh, especially the ones on the uh, alert pad, were always loaded, ready to go drop these bombs at a moment's notice. But while I was in the Air Force, I met uh, sergeants, men who were older than me, and had been in the Air Force for quite a while, told me that they had participated in projects that had recovered crashed extraterrestrial craft, what you call UFOs. And uh, they never told these stories unless they had quite a bit to drink. So I never really believed it. I thought, well, these guys are running a scam on me. You know, even though I'd heard about these things when I was a kid, uh, I just still didn't believe in them. It's just so far out in left field, it's not something that you really give any serious thought to until something personal happens, which came later. Well, I left the Air Force, I went into the Navy, uh, which is really where I wanted to be in the first place. I'd always had this tremendous uh, feeling and connection with the, with the ocean. I was an excellent swimmer. Uh, but I had a problem as a, as a child. I, was, I had chronic motion sickness. If I got in a car and we went on a long trip, I got deathly ill. And same with boats or anything. I couldn't ride on the things at the carnival that went around and around. Uh, because it just made me tremendously ill. But I decided after I had uh, gone through the Air Force experience that, um, sick or not, you know, I was going to go in the Navy because that's really what I had wanted to do. So I did. Volunteered for submarine duty um, and was assigned to the USS Tyru SS-416, which was a diesel-electric boat, World War II type, that had been reconfigured. Uh, when I went on board the, the boat, it was in the dry dock at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard and had literally been cut in half. They put in a 12-foot sonar section and then three domes on the deck for triangulating targets using sonar. Um, and this was really one of the, um, the most up-to-date electronically submarines that we had. Um, it wasn't a nuclear one submarine, but uh, as, as far as the ability to approach, get close to a target and destroy it, um, it, it had a better capacity to do that than any other boat that we had. Um, while we were on a transit from the Portland, Seattle area on the surface, I actually saw, I was the port lookout, uh, and I saw the most incredible thing that I think I've ever seen in my life, uh, and, it, and it had such a profound effect upon my view of the universe and the world that we live in um, that I wish everybody could experience this. I saw come up out of the ocean from beneath the surface of the sea a huge disc-shaped craft about the size of a midway class aircraft carrier which is tremendous in size uh, even though that's one of our smallest carriers there was then um, it's still a huge tremendously big object came up out of the ocean and rose into the air and tumbled on its axis and went up into the clouds and I was awestruck, dumbstruck and uh, I mean dumbstruck literally I could not utter a sound uh, and my first um, impulse was to tell the officer of the deck that I'd seen a flying saucer and then luckily for me I couldn't talk uh, because on second thought that's not what I really wanted to say uh, because I didn't want to be the only Looney Tunes character on a submarine with a tight-knit crew that you had to live close in close quarters with uh, uh, because that's uh, that's a hell of a way to live. So I told the officer the deck that I'd seen something about 15 degrees off the port bow at a relative distance of about two and a half nautical miles and uh, um, he began to look in that area and the starboard lookout had heard me tell him this and he began to look over there and while we were all three watching uh, either the same craft or another one exactly like it came down out of the clouds tumbled again on it why it did this maneuver I don't know but every single time it did it it's like it came down in this attitude and then it flipped over and then entered the water uh, and the water just appeared to open up in front of it it's just like the, the count in the, in the Bible about the parting of the Red Sea 
that's exactly what happened. The sea actually parted and this thing went into the water and then it closed up behind it. And this big spray went up into the air. But it wasn't a spray from the craft hitting the water. It was a spray from the water coming back in to fill up this hole that had been created. And uh, again, you know, I'm thinking this, this is incredible. It's, what are we looking at here? And it was metal, it was a machine, and, and uh, it wasn't glowing or anything like that. It didn't have any lights on it that we could see. Um, but it was obviously metal, and it was obviously a machine. And uh, although I can't tell you that there was anyone inside of it, I believe that there was. Um, and it did something that, that, as far as I knew, was absolutely impossible. I'd been in the Air Force. I'd worked on the state of the art of our of our uh, aviation capabilities, and here I was on the deck of a submarine in the conning tower, and I knew what we had to be able to have to go underwater, and I knew that the two were incompatible. Here's something that came from under the water and flew in the air, and performed maneuvers, and then came back down and interfaced with the water at tremendous speed, uh, and remained intact. Uh, which, realistically, it, it, it never touched the water. The water sort of magically opened up in front of it, but something had to interface with that water. Anything that we had that interfaced with the water in that manner would have been disintegrated. It's like hitting a brick wall. So I was looking at a technology that as far as our laws of physics and what we knew at that time didn't exist. This was in 1966. Uh, and uh, Ensign Ball was uh, as shocked as I was. He called the captain to the bridge. He came up with the chief quartermaster who brought a camera. And uh, we all stood there and watched this occur over and over again for about ten minutes. And I still to this day don't know if it was the same craft or a whole bunch of different craft going in and out of the water. But it seemed like that there was a hell of a lot of traffic on that freeway right there. <laughs> and we were watching it as we went by. We never changed course. We never lowered or, or increased our speed. Uh, we made no attempt to communicate or signal. Uh, we made no attempt to get closer. Um, and eventually, uh, it just stopped. We were told not to discuss it with anyone, not even amongst ourselves, which was... Incredible! I never had been told anything like that in my life. You know, you can't talk about something. And to be told that we couldn't even talk about it amongst ourselves was even more extraordinary, I thought. Um, but we didn't. We didn't talk about it. When we got to uh, Pearl Harbor, oh, all, all the time the chief quartermaster was taking pictures of this. So I know photographs were made. Uh, what happened to those photographs, I have no idea. But when we reached Pearl Harbor, we were not allowed to go ashore to... Um, to uh, go on liberty, even though we didn't have the duty. And uh, about two hours after we berthed uh, at the submarine base, a commander from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and uh, debriefed each one of us individually in the captain's stateroom. And the, uh, the ultimate outcome of the debriefing was that uh, we didn't see anything, we didn't hear anything, and we had to read rules and regulations uh, that told us that if we ever talked about what it was that we didn't see, um, that we could uh, be imprisoned, uh, we could be fined uh, $10,000, we could lose all pay and allowances due or ever to become due. And I learned at that moment that the United States Navy didn't want anybody to know um, about what we saw and that uh, severe consequences could come down around the neck of anybody who did. And that was when I understood fully that, uh, yeah, there's a real cover-up. These things do exist, number one, uh, and uh, at least the United States Navy doesn't want anybody to know about it. And there's stiff penalties for anybody who bucks that. Thank <laughs> you.
While I was on submarines, being junior in the Navy, real junior, I had to stand lookout watches. Lookouts are well-trained professional observers. They are not just someone that they grab out of the galley and stick it there with a pair of binoculars. You are well-trained because before you yell to the officer of the deck that you got to shoot at something coming at you off the port beam, you got to know that that's really the enemy and not the admiral coming out for a visit. <laughs> and that's really the main reason for it. <laughs> so, we were trained observers. Now, this is extremely important to me personally, because without this experience, I probably would not have lent the importance that the later information that I was going to see, I probably would not have realized how important it was. While on lookout between the Portland, Seattle area and the Pearl Harbor area, while we were traveling on the surface as port lookout, I saw a craft the size of an aircraft carrier exit the water at a range of approximately two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter. The port quarter is approximately 45 de relative degrees off the port bow. Port is your left. Left port wine is red. That's where the red light is on a ship. Okay, now we got through that. <laughs> I was stunned. I knew that I had just seen something that was absolutely incredible and nobody in the world would believe that I saw it and nobody else saw it. And I was faced with the dilemma. I'm the port lookout. Something just came up out of the water that could destroy us in a second. It was a machine. It was intelligently guided. I knew this. It was as big as an aircraft carrier. It was the most important earth-shattering thing that had ever happened to me in my life because I saw it. I realized what it was. I knew I wasn't dreaming. There was nobody around who could be manipulating me in any way, shape, or form. And it was my responsibility to report this. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to tell the man who writes my performance report that I just saw this thing come out of the water? You've got to be nuts. But I had a responsibility to the safety of the ship, the boat, which we call submarines, boats, not ships, to the boat and to the crew. So I had to devise a method to report this. And what I did was I told the officer of the deck, Ensign Ball, I said, Ensign Ball, I saw something about two and a half nautical miles off the port quarter, but it just flashed and I don't know what it was. Could you please help me scour that area to see if we can find it again? Now, I didn't really believe that this thing was going to show up again at all. Well, the starboard lookout heard this conversation and he turned around and started looking too, which he shouldn't have done because you're never supposed to desert your own field of responsibility, but he did. At about that time, the object came, or this object, or another one just like it, came back down out of the clouds and entered the water. Ensign Ball dropped his binoculars, dropped his jaw, and turned around and just stared at me and didn't say a word. And then he turned back around and he just stared off into space for a couple of minutes. And then he turned around and looked at me again. And he said, this had to happen on my watch. <laughs> He then called the captain to the bridge, which on any naval vessel means that there is an emergency in progress. You do not call the captain to the bridge unless there is an emergency situation, unless his presence is needed. If you call the captain to the bridge and his presence is not needed, you are in deep, deep, deeper than the submarine will dive to trouble. <laughs> And it's lucky they didn't have submarines in the old Navy when they killed all the people. 
Now, the captain came to the bridge, and so did the chief quartermaster, because it was his job to come to the bridge with the captain, with a 35 millimeter camera, any time anything like this happened. This event repeated itself several times over a seven to ten minute period, and we watched it. It would exit the water, go and disappear in the clouds, and then another ship, or the same ship, would re-enter the water. We were told by the captain before we left the con, the bridge, not to discuss it with the other crew members, that it was classified top secret, and that we were never to mention it to anyone. Now, the crew knew about it. How they knew about it, I don't know, but I suspect that it was picked up on sonar and radar also, in which case the sonar men and the radar men would know about it too. And I believe that is what has happened, and I believe that they were also told not to talk to anyone. But several crew members came up to me and wanted to know if we really saw a UFO, and I told them uh, that I was not allowed to discuss what happened, uh, and I didn't know what I saw anyway. So that was the end of that. When we arrived in Pearl Harbor, a officer from the Office of Naval Intelligence came on board and debriefed each one of us independently of the others. I do not know what went on in the debriefings of the other personnel involved, but when I went in, he began to ask me <coughs> what I saw. When I began to describe to him what I saw, he became very upset, even enraged. And having come from a military family, having a father who was an Air Force pilot and an officer, having served four years in the Air Force, I knew what this man wanted to hear it was obvious to me. So I told him what he wanted to hear so that I didn't have to go through with what I knew I would have to go through if I told him anything else. So I told him, sir, I did not see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, that's the spirit. I had to sign a security oath, I was dismissed, told that I was a good sailor, had a good future with the Navy, and I left. <laughs> On the way out, Seaman Deidre Alamo was braced up against the bulkhead in the passageway, and I whispered to him, tell him you didn't say anything. <laughs> and I don't know whether he did or not, because we never talked about it again amongst ourselves.